Welcome back to a series of videos sizing columns to resist combined gravity and overturning moment from wind in tall buildings. In this particular <clears throat> video we're going to talk about a nine square building plan. We're going to lay out how to solve the problem and then your assignment will be to take a partially blank spreadsheet and fill in the appropriate cells to perform the computations necessary to account for the gravity forces and the forces of the overturning moment due to wind. Um, this is the footprint of the building. It's based what I'm calling a nine square. Um, there are three bays along each side. Each of those bays is 40 feet. So the total dimension across the facade of the building in every direction is three times 40 or 120 feet. We're going to assume that it's a steel frame building with steel columns and steel beams everywhere. These interior beams are all represented as pin jointed. So you'll notice in this diagram, they don't come all the way to the column. There's a break there, which is our standard graphic technique for saying these are clip angle connections or some sort of connection that has no uh, significant moment capacity. We're going to assume that each of the facades of the building is outfitted with a large coarse truss system, uh, something like um, the John Hancock building in Chicago. We're going to assume that the primary agents in resisting a wind force like this is the truss in this wall and the truss in this wall. We're also going to assume that these columns have not been designed to particularly participate in this overturning moment resistance issue. Um, they don't have as good a lever arm as the corner columns. And so we're going to focus on a system where the truss work in the facades is primarily engaging the corner columns. So under this wind load, this column would tend to go into tension as would this column right here. This column and this column will go into a higher level of compression. All these columns are going to carry both gravity, uh, all, all the columns in the building will carry gravity loads, but the corner columns are also going to have a major role in resisting the overturning moment of wind. This is the influence area for the gravity loads that are going to get transferred to this column. Uh, the influence area goes halfway to the next column in that direction and halfway to the next column in this direction. We're going to assume that this is all steel beams, that we have a concrete slab floor in between. There's a core here, which for the moment we don't have to worry about because we're going to focus on the corner columns that are taking compression from gravity and also compression from the overturning moment. The loads that we're going to consider for the moment are uh, 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live. And then 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the wind. And when we take this full factored wind load, we're not required to take 1.6 times the live load because statistically speaking, it's um, unlikely that the building, extremely unlikely that the building would be absolutely fully loaded with people. Uh, when there's the full wind load. Um, also of interest is this third load case, um, which might involve uplift, in which case we have to make sure that there's a foundation there that provides enough ballast and that the column is properly connected. Uh, but for right now, we're going to focus on just how big do these columns need to be. 
and the the governing load cases in that case will be either one or two because the columns that are subjected to this load case where we might have some uplift they're going to be working in tension so they're going to tend to not have buckling problems they're going to tend to work more efficiently uh, but also the wind uplift is going to be counteracted to some degree by this uh, dead load helping to hold the building down so we're not going to worry too much uh, about this load case right now it we would have to worry about it a lot when we get to designing the foundations and connecting the columns to the foundations to make sure that uh, the building doesn't lift up and topple over because it lets loose from its foundation so this is the spreadsheet that we're going to use to do our computation and for reference we've re re, uh, uh, repeated this floor plan image here uh, to help us visualize all this as we go along. So to summarize, all columns are carrying gravity loads. Uh, there are no bearing walls anywhere. It's all steel frame columns and beams and truss work in the exterior facades. There's no truss work or shear wall or rigid frame around the core. In other words, these are pure gravity columns. There's no moment connections. There's no triangulation. There's no shear wall. Uh, the core will have to be fireproofed and properly protected, but it's not a major structural element in terms of resisting any kind of lateral movement. The four columns around this core are pure gravity columns. They do not participate in any way in resisting the lateral forces. The exterior columns are laced together in a coarse truss to make a truss tube around the building. Uh, the exterior truss work mainly engages the corner columns. So in this process, you're given permission to assume initially that the four column corner columns take the overwhelming burden of resisting the overturning moment of the wind. So the column spacing that's presumed here is 40 feet. Um, that's put in a blue bold number so that it's understood that we now are creating a template and we could go back and change that number if we wanted to. The floor to floor dimension is 11 feet and again that's blue to indicate that we can go edit that if we want to. We're going to assume a concrete floor slab. Uh, we set a formula in the past that said we know we can span 30 feet with uh, an 8 inch deep uh, post tensioned concrete floor. Um, so this number represents 8 inches over 30 feet and we're multiplying by B12 which is the actual span and what this is saying is we need something deeper to span this 40 feet. This 8 over 30 by the way uh, can apply to slabs that are just supported on two sides or even slabs that are supported by point loads. Um, in extreme cases, we can go 30 feet with an 8 inch deep slab supported locally by columns. So the fact that we have um, support around the entire boundary of this slab means that that slab is probably going to be shallower than this. But nonetheless, as an estimate, we're putting in that for structural reasons, it's going to have to be 10.67 inches deep. Uh, the whole thing would have to be 8 inches deep to uh, put the plumbing, embed the plumbing in it. We always pick the larger of these two numbers, so that says this slab is going to be 10.67 inches deep. We have 120 pounds a cubic foot for the concrete. This is less dense than the maximum density of 150, which corresponds to heavy aggregate. This could be because we're going to use a lighter aggregate, or it could be because we're going to fill some voids in this floor um, with some lighter material like uh, plastic uh, and trained air. Um, so we have 120 pounds per cubic foot for the density of the concrete. The columns we're going to take as having a density as a stress capacity or a yield stress of 50 kips per square inch. Uh, so I'm going to correct this. 
and the resistance factor for that is 0 0.85. And by the way, this would have been a horrible mistake, except that all of my mathematics down the way was based on this being kips per square inch. So we won't have terrible ramifications in terms of the sizes of things we're going to calculate. Okay, so this is the yield stress. The design stress is going to be this resistance factor times 50 kips per square inch. All right, so we're going to deal with gravity loads first. Uh, first of all, the area distributed load of the floor is going to equal the thickness of the floor, which is this number in inches. We'll have to convert that to feet by dividing by 12. And then we're going to multiply it times this 120 pounds per cubic foot to figure out the load per square foot. So that's what this is saying is we multiply B16, which is the thickness, over 12, which converts that to the thickness in feet. In feet. We're going to multiply that times B17, and we get 106.7 pounds per square foot of floor. The live load for offices would be taken to be 80 pounds a square foot. If we were sizing a small amount of floor area, we'd have to design everything within that to handle this full 80 pounds a square foot. The more floor area that we're designing for, um, the lower this number can get. Um, and the theory for that is that if you have a huge area of floor, it's not going to be totally loaded to the limit. And by the way, this is a serious loading to the limit. 80 pounds a square foot is pretty much everybody chest to chest and uh, shoulder to shoulder filling the entire space. This can happen for some portion of the floor area, but it's unlikely to happen for the entire building. So. We're going to be focusing on sizing the columns at the base of the building just to get a sort of issue, uh, an idea of the order of magnitude of the size of things. Um, and so for sizing those columns, we can pretty much reduce this to the maximum. So uh, typically we can reduce the load down to about 60% based on this notion it's not fully loaded everywhere. So if we take 0.6, times 80 pounds a square foot, we get 48 pounds a square foot. And that's the live load that we're going to take for sizing the members that we're focusing on right now, which are columns, which are supporting large amounts of floor area. Okay, so now we can take this factored load, 1.2 times the dead load plus 1.6 times the live load. And again, this is lowercase p. So this is area distributed load. So we're going to take 1.2 times this number plus 1.6 times that number and we get 204.8. So that's 1.2 times B22, which is this, plus 1.6 times B24. Now, we know that this little corner of the building here is what's getting supported by that column. Its influence area is 20 by 20 feet. And so we're going to multiply this number times 20 times 20 um, to get the load on that column. And by the way, you'll notice we're ignoring the self-weight of the column. We've done exercises in the past that say, particularly for heavily loaded columns, they are so incredibly efficient that typically the weight is much less than 1% of the load they support. So to first order for the moment, we're just going to ignore the self-weight of the column. So we're going to multiply this number times, so that's B25, times half of the base spacing. So the base spacing is B12, which is 40 feet, times half of the base spacing again. And now I've put a, a divider here of a thousand because if I stay in pounds, the numbers are going to get very large. So to simplify things and keep the numbers more reasonable, I'm deciding to convert to kips. So I have 81.9 kips 
And to get to that, I divided this number, which would have been in pounds, because that's pounds per square foot, and this is feet, and that's feet. So when you multiply all that together, we end up with pounds, and then we divide by a thousand to get it into kips. So this is the force in the column due to the portion of the gravity load that is supporting associated with one floor of the building. So now we're going to come down here and we're going to say, well, what's the total factor gravity force on the corner column at the bottom of the bottom story of a building with multiple floors? Well, the first building only has one floor. At the bottom of that, that number is just equal to this number um, because that's from a single floor. When we add a second, when we go to a taller building, which is two stories, then we're going to double this number. And so we're going to take this number and we're going to multiply it times that. And so we just have this linear progression. And the more floors we add, uh, the more we increase the size of this load. And again, we're able to do that because typically the weight of the columns we're sort of ignoring for the moment. So now we can say, well, we want a certain cross section of area of steel to safely resist this force. So we're going to say, we're going to use our formula. Um, stress is equal to force over area. Or we're going to rearrange that and we're going to say area is equal to force over stress. So in this formula, the first term is B29, which is the force from right here that we're trying to resist. And then we're going to divide that by the design stress for the steel. So the design stress for the steel is going to be the yield stress times this resistance factor. So when we go into the denominator, we see we have B18, which is the yield stress for the steel, B19, which is the fee factor or resistance factor. So we're going to divide that into this force to get a certain area. Now, when you think about it, this is slightly less than two square inches. And in fact, if we want to know the side of a square that would be able to handle this load without crushing of the material. We take the square root of this area, that's the side, which is 1.39 inches by 1.39 inches. Now we all know instinctively that's an absurd column because an 11 foot tall column uh, with such small dimensions is going to be extremely vulnerable to buckling. So obviously we're not going to use a square solid column here. Um, we would um, make that into some sort of pipe or hollow tube. And even then it's probably going to have a much larger area than this because by the time we provide that much area and we've made it big enough that it doesn't have overall buckling problems, it will have thin wall column buckling problems. So, or uh, thin wall buckling problems. So this number is kind of absurd, but on the other hand, the number points out that the size of the column at the top of the building is very, very small on the scale of all the things we're talking about. It's negligible. So we're going to just do this. We're going to fill these three formulas down. And when we get down to an 80 story building, which is 880 feet high. Our formula says that we need a column that's 12.4 inches by 12.4 inches. Now we could actually probably do this with a solid column because probably for an 11 foot height, we don't even really have any serious buckling problems, but we're almost certainly not going to do this, that we're going to make this column out of some kind of really heavy uh, 14 inch series jumbo section like a W14 by 808 pounds or something like that. I don't, I don't have the tables in front of me right now and we're not going to focus on that level of detail. We're just trying to get a sense of how much steel is in this column. This is pretty reasonable to carry the gravity load. But keep in mind it's not the most heavily loaded column. 
uh, if we went to one of the interior columns, we'd almost quadruple this number and therefore quadruple the area, and that means probably double this. So um, one shouldn't get too carried away that this is such a small column. It's basically a foot by a foot. Um, but this column has another major responsibility in this building, and we're going to uh, we're going to go account for that now, and that is wind load. Now, when we do wind loads, let me go back to these load cases. We said that if we have a full factored wind load, we only need one times the live load, and 1.2 times the dead load plus the full factored 1.6 wind, wind load. So we're going to redo this calculation. Excuse me for that delay. We're going to redo this calculation. And instead of taking this full factored force, which is this number times the area of floor that's being supported, or excuse me, the number of floors, we're going to take this number. So what is this number? This is 1.2 times P dead plus 1.0 times P live. Now this is not a legitimate load case all by itself because we're only allowed to throttle back to 1 times P live on the floor because we intend to combine this with the overturning moment effect of the wind. So. But nonetheless, we're going to proceed and we're going to say this is 1.2 times that number plus 1 times that number. So we get 176. Um, and then we're going to multiply that times the half of the base spacing, which is 20 feet. And 20 feet again, again, we're dividing by 1,000 to convert this to kips. So we're going to take this number and we're going to multiply it times this, the floor. So when I go here, I see it's A29, which in this case is one floor times this number, which is the total factored force in that column associated with 1.2 dead plus one live. And then, of course, when we go to two floors, we have twice as much. When we go to three floors, we have three times as much and so forth. Now, we're going to let this column sit here for a minute because we got to go off and do some computations having to do with wind. But what we're going to do is scroll over and we're going to keep this column in the field of view because we're going to have to combine it with something. Now, for wind loads, we're assuming an overall effective wind pressure of 30 pounds a square foot which would be roughly two-thirds on the windward side and one-third on the leeward side. Um, for the purposes of the kind of calculation we're doing right now, we don't need to make any distinction between those two. We're going to just assume that there's 30 pounds a square foot for whatever uh, area is presented to the wind. Then we multiply by 1.6 and the 30 becomes uh, basically 48. Now, here's where you need to pay a little attention. Um, H25 is this pressure. So that's this term right here. This is the area of the story, which is for one bay. So I'm going to rearrange this, actually, because I want it to be a little less confusing. So that's the width of the facade right there. And B13 is the height of one story. So my formula becomes, it's one half, and the reason it's one half is half of whatever wind pressure or force, excuse me, that's exerted on that story goes to the truss on one side and half goes to the truss on the other side. So I'm taking the pressure H25 
times the width of the facade times the height of one floor and then I'm taking half of that. So that's the net force that's at mid height on that floor that's exerted on the side truss which is edge on into the wind and which is resisting the wind. Now again I divide it by a thousand because now this number is going to start getting very large if I keep it in pounds so I'm converting to kips. So now I have to count for the overturning moment. And I'm going to go back. I don't actually have a drawing for this, but I'll remind you that that force we just calculated is applied halfway up the story. So this is the previous building we looked at where we were looking at an overturning moment <clears throat> due to the wind force. <clears throat> so we took a force right here, <clears throat> which was the net force on that resisting system. And we said it's applied halfway up the story. So here we had a half a story. Here we had a lever arm for this force of one and a half stories. And here we have a lever arm of two and a half and so forth. And these blue forces are the uh, resisting moment or couple that keeps the building from toppling over in this direction. So we'll I've updated this formula to apply to the case we're talking about of the four of the nine square building. If we only had a one story building, we'd have this 31.7 kips of force, which is the portion of the force exerted on that face of that story that's going over to uh, the truss that we're trying to analyze. And that truss has as a major agent internal to it, this corner column, which is taking the brunt of the force that that truss is generating. So when we multiply these together, we get 174 kips. So that's this number right here, which is basically A29 is one, meaning it's one story. We take half of that off, which puts us at half a story up. B13 is the floor to floor dimension. So this portion, this times that is the lever arm of five and a half feet. And then H26 is this force, which is the force we've ascertained is being applied to that braced element on that side of the building where we're trying to size the corner column. Now this one is going to be two stories. A30 corresponds to the number two, which means we have a two story building. For the second floor, it's going to be two minus 0.5 or a lever arm of one and a half times the floor to floor dimension, which is B13, um, times the area distributed, times the force rather. So this is the force of 31.7. This is the height of the floor, and this, when we multiply it times the height of the floor, is one and a half times the height of the floor, and that's the lever arm for the moment that is being created by the wind force on the second floor. Now, if I want the overturning moment for all these forces, I then have to go back in and add in the overturning moment from the first floor. So in this term, I just calculated the overturning moment from the second floor, and then I remembered to add in the previous term, which, or the previous cell, which was the overturning moment from the first floor. And now when I come here, I'm gonna do the calculation for the third floor, and I'm gonna add H30, which was the overturning moment from the second and the first floor cumulatively. So once I have this formula in, I can then go fill down and I'm going to do that just to demonstrate I hit control D and those numbers don't change because that's how I generated those numbers. Okay, so this moment, this overturning moment consists of a force couple and we want to ascertain what those forces are so that we can then size the column. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say this is going to equal H29, which is the overturning moment, 
divided by the width of the face of the building. So the width of the face of the building is three times the bay spacing because there's three bays, 40 feet each. So that's 120 feet. We're dividing 120 into this in order to get the force because the moment is the force times the spacing or in other words, the force is equal to the moment divided by the spacing. And that formula is pretty simple and we just fill down on that formula. And the key thing is, initially you'll notice an incredibly small force associated with this overturning moment. Shouldn't surprise you, it's a 120 foot wide building. We're applying the force five and a half feet up. So the contribution of that wind load is pretty inconsequential. Um, what's more interesting is to scroll down here and find out where the force of the internal resisting moment becomes the dominant issue. And it's somewhere down in this neighborhood. I'm going to put it right there. We're getting close. Right in this neighborhood. This gravity force, which is due to 1.2 dead plus 1.0 live, is around 33 or 3400. This is the force of the overturning moment. So by the time we get to this height of building, which by the way is 48 or 49 floors, the wind load is beginning to dominate. Now the wind load forces are smaller to start with. Um, and just to illustrate that point, I'm going to go up here and I'm going to say, this is the gravity force, which is more than double the wind force on a given floor. But keep in mind that the wind has this extremely important lever arm effect. So when the building becomes very tall, the wind begins to dominate. So anyway, what we're going to do is this is the force associated with the internal resisting moment against wind overturning. This is the force due to gravity. And now we're going to add that to that to get this figure. And initially gravity just utterly dominates and wind is not too significant. But we're going to now take that formula and we're going to fill down. So I'm going to do control D and now it's giving me more decimal places than I want. But basically that's how we're calculating this. So now we have a total cumulative force due to both the overturning moment from the wind and the gravity load. And now we can again calculate the required area um, by taking this force, which is J29, and dividing it by the yield stress of the steel times the resistance factor for the steel. And initially we have very small areas required this column is even smaller at the top because we've reduced the gravity load and the wind load hasn't really had any significant impact yet. So before we had 1.34 square inches by 1.34 inches and now it's even smaller. Again, that's an absurd column, a square column that's like 12, 11 feet tall and has such small dimensions. Um, but we're not sizing this, these top floors in any detail. We're mainly trying to get at the bottom of the building. So I'm going to scroll down here. And what this says is to resist both the gravity forces and the overturning moment of wind, where we have full factored wind, full factored dead load, and one time the live load. The size of that column has to be an 18.74 inch by 18.74 inch solid steel column. That's about the amount of material we're going to need because that column will be so fat that it will tend to not have buckling issues. So the shape we choose in the end 
for that column is going to be dictated to some degree about what's easy to fabricate and how is it easy to make connections to things. So that ends our uh, lecture on the nine square building and how to size the corner columns. Um, you're going to be given a spreadsheet which looks exactly like this one except these key formulas down here and over on this side of the spreadsheet over here are going to be deleted. So you need to fill in those formulas and you'll want to check to see that over here for just gravity, full factor gravity, you get these dimensions for your square column. And then over here that you get these dimensions for your square column. And then I'm going to ask you to tell me what those dimensions would be for a hundred story building. So that ends our video on the nine square building, sizing columns to resist combined gravity and overturning moment of wind. And your assignment will be given and you'll use the spreadsheet to perform these calculations.